Hey, good morning. Let's go ahead and get started for today. I hope you had a good weekend. I know this is a bit of a challenging time. A lot of folks who have had to be under quarantine, a lot of people with athletics and other things that have to be canceled and so on. Um, so I know this is a bit of a challenging time, but I appreciate all of your hard work and engagement with the class so far. We've got several folks joining us on Zoom. Again, if you're not able to make class, if you're feeling sick, if you've had exposure, please reach out to Student Affairs, and that way uh, you can get rolling on officially being in quarantine. Um, if you are not able to make class and you're feeling a little behind, we need some additional support. Happy to reach out to you too. Again. Um, I have office hours, including right after class, where I just go upstairs and I'm available to chat with you. Uh, and I'm also happy to set up an appointment to go over anything that I can do to catch you up first. So I want to start today with an individual assignment uh, just to think about and do some brainstorming. As a reminder, you have your first writing assignment uh, due this Wednesday by midnight. Uh, at this point, you should have some progress on this assignment, including drafting or outlining together. Um, if not, I really encourage you to take some time today to make sure that you're able to get that in by Wednesday. And then what I want you to do is to think about, first of all, how you're doing on this assignment. So if you, for instance, have an outline or a draft and you're working on revisions right now, that's great. If you have not started, but you know what you want to work on, okay. Um, so take some time to take inventory on where you are with this assignment, uh, knowing that it's due by Wednesday at midnight. And uh, what's finished, what still needs to be worked on. Secondarily, I want you to sort of discuss the ways that you chose that group. Well, what is the group that you chose? And why did you pick this group in particular? And then lastly, uh, if you have remaining questions regarding this assignment, um, you are welcome to jot or write those down. And I'm happy to address those questions in class. So it's due on Wednesday, right? Um, if you Let's turn it in late for unexcused, right? It's minus 5% for each day something is late. Uh, but you could also choose if you want to use your get out of jail free card to turn it in up to a week late with no penalty. Uh, it's up to you as whether you use it for that assignment or you save it for a later.
So it is use it or lose it. Okay. So uh, if you don't use it the entire quarter, then there's no like bonus or extra thing that comes up. So uh, okay. you could choose not to use it, and that's totally fine. But it wouldn't add anything at that point. Good question. So I'm going to take the time now to see um, does anybody have any questions related to this assignment? Things that came up, things that are still a little bit uncertain. Just as a reminder, as you're working through everything, um, I do recommend checking on Canvas both the uh, rubric as well as the whole prompt for the assignment. Right? Um, I think that just working through that as you're completing uh, will help. Should be showing up under your coming up, and also uh, it'll be if you are on the front page where it shows up on the grid. Remember that for this assignment, right? Um, you're looking first at how the small group communicates that you've chosen, if you one you're currently a part of, like an athletic group or team, or one that you've been a part of in the past. Um, secondarily, right, we've talked about Belvin's self perception inventory, nine different roles. Explain your own role that you've chosen. Uh, and why you feel like that makes sense. And then lastly, some strengths and weaknesses of the way that your group communicates. Again, the rubric on the second page is how I'll be grading. Um, so I try to lay out pretty clearly what I'm expecting, um, fully addressing those three prompts, having at least two pages, using things like introductions, conclusions, and body points for good organization. Remember that for citations, right? If you use MLA, APA, or Chicago, I do have the full uh, work cited for APA through the textbook uh, available for you on campus. Also, um, remember that whenever you're directly quoting, you all are going to need to include the page number. So make sure you're following along and maybe going back to the textbook if you need to use a specific page number or citation there. That's been the big thing that I've noticed in rough drafts that I've seen so far is some of them haven't included the page number. Um, another thing, right, is make sure um, if you're explaining clearly what this group is and your role within the group, um, one thing that you don't need to include in this assignment, right, is like really big sweeping sentences about like uh, small groups bring us together or how we communicate, right? Like we don't need a larger preamble. Instead, dedicate things to introduction and conclusion a bit more specifically to your topic and the thing that you're for there. I'm still willing to look at rough drafts or outlines, but we please get them to me by the end of the day today so that I have enough time to report them to you. So what I'd like you to do now is to find a partner or a group of three to share your current progress on the group members of reflection. Um, it could be, for instance, the group that you selected, why you selected that group. You can also take some time if you have some remaining challenges or issues that you're trying to take, figure out, or maybe you're deciding between a couple options for your assignment uh, to take some time to brainstorm and chat about it. Too. So take a few minutes to share your progress and what you're working on for this assignment. Uh, Zoom folks, I'll put you all together in a great effort. I'm <laughs> 
really trying to empathize with uh, and focus on the needs of other people. Again, when you're in a group, you have a much larger collection of folks to listen to, a lot of challenges in listening effectively, uh, but a lot of the potential to brainstorm, to bounce off ideas, and to grow. Uh, Calm 3.30, are you listening, which I know a couple people are already in, is a class that gets into some of the more specifics of how to listen effectively. So this is a topic that's interesting to you. We offer a course that focuses on these ideas a little bit more. So for this class, right, we talked a little bit about the group membership reflection, giving you a chance to do some brainstorming there. Uh, we'll be talking a lot about culture, right, and the way that cultures relate to small group communication. Uh, the core idea to take away from this week is that culture relates to small group communication and what we do in two key ways. The first way is that cultures are formed in groups, right? A workplace culture or a group culture is developed over time. For instance, if you're a member of a sports or athletic team, there's a good chance that that team has a history, it has practices, it has traditions, it has norms, it has things it's, it does, right? that a small group can be a culture in of itself, right? A business or workplace culture is another example. The second key idea though, is that culture of people in a group, right? Their lived experiences, their perspectives, aspects including race, identity, nationality, uh, sexuality, sexual orientation, ethnicity, and so on, right? Play a really key role in how group members work together. That not only can a culture be created from a group, but that people bring their own culture and background into a group. And both of those things are important for us to understand as we're thinking about how groups communicate. There is a course that gets into this idea in a little bit more detail. Intercultural communication is also a course we offer here at EOU. So if you're interested in exploring these ideas in more detail, you might consider a uh, class like that. So, kind of at the core of it, right? Is getting at and trying to understand what culture is and how culture works. Does anybody want to take a stab at defining culture in their own words? What is culture? I'm glad you bring in the idea of norms and expectations, right? That, that becomes a pretty big role. Is there anything someone would like to ask in what a culture is, or maybe an example of a culture? I feel like culture kind of has to do with like the past and like the history kind of stuff, like in an organization or uh, a group. Yeah, that's a good point, Alina, right? The idea that history, uh, the past, right? The context shapes a culture, that culture is developed over time, right? So these get a lot of elements of what culture is, right? Pictured here on the right is something that's really cool. Um, there's actually a world map of a lot of indigenous cultures and groups um, and where those are located geographically, right? So it's a map that kind of reshapes uh, the world in a way that accounts for changes in territory and location. And the use, right, of physical space and location uh, really matters in a lot of groups, right? For instance, uh, many of the indigenous tribes and groups around Eastern Oregon uh, and Washington, right, including the Umatilla, uh, Walla Walla, and Cayuse people, right, are able to occupy many of these physical spaces, which impacts how members of many of these groups communicate relate to and understand the geographical space. So culture is about beliefs, right? What is important? What do members of a culture really hold dear to them? For instance, maybe a value of physical space and land uh, which they occupy. Attitudes, how do people approach or think about issues, right? For instance, some people view conflict as inevitable, as just a thing that you do. Well, other people view conflict as something to avoid, right? Attitudes matter. Values, right? We're 
deal with the idea of what's important to you, especially a terminal value, what's important in of itself. For instance, right, we've seen a lot of classes in the United States on differences between the values of freedom versus security. What are some of the things such as uh, surveillance, wiretapping of phones, so on, right? Traditions, right, get to the latest point. There's history, there's context, there's shared experiences that are developed over time. If your family has traditions for particular holidays, right, then that's an example of how your family developed that type of culture. And it involves psychological expectations. That is, uh, as a member of a culture, we predict and anticipate that our communication is going to happen in a specific way, right? If you're a member of a group and every time um, you have as part of your athletic team an MVP, you take them out for ice cream, right? You're going to expect if you did really well and you were the MVP, right, that you would get to go out. Um, you have this psychological expectation about how members of the group communicate and work together uh, in a cultural context. Yeah, so Destiny's point about culture being about shared beliefs really ties closely here too, right? That there's a shared understanding among people in a group about what's important and how people work together. So I wanted to show, again, this is really kind of a cool example of uh, a map, right, of a lot of indigenous cultures and groups throughout the world. Um, I wanted to focus specifically on the area that we oftentimes consider, right, the Eastern Oregon and Washington, the ways that many of these groups would be defined. Right, so it's kind of fun to play around with it and check out a lot of the different areas um, to sort of see, right, where many of these groups are located. So again, many of these examples are throughout Oregon. The case, McKellen, Walla Walla, over here, around the eastern Oregon, Washington area, right? And when we look at the geographical location of uh, many of these present groups, right? These are examples of different cultures of identity, the way that things such as uh, physical location, right? Such as mountains, streams, oceans, so on, uh, shape the way the cultural identity is developed over time. So I just wanted to share that again as an example of how we can think about um, the role of culture even in a geographic lens too. Another idea, right, is the idea that there's a lot of communication that can happen in and across different cultures. Uh, so one example, right, is ASL or American Sign Language. Here's if there's anybody here that knows ASL well. Click down, yeah. Right, so ESL, right, is um, only an example of the many types of sign language. In fact, right, sign language actually has a lot of different uh, accents and ways that it's uh, pronounced differently depending on things such as uh, the speed at which somebody signs, uh, things such as age, so on. So if you're in a group of people who are speaking American Sign Language, right, or using signs to communicate with one another, uh, that would be what's considered intracultural communication. Intracultural communication means that you are communicating with members of the same culture or group, right? If you've taken inter interpersonal communication, right, that's the same idea as intrapersonal communication, or talking to yourself, right? You're talking to members of the same group. So intracultural communication would be communication within um, members of the same team. Intercultural communication, though, is the idea that we communicate uh, with people that are parts of different cultures. You can think about inter, right, as interaction. So for instance, there are a lot of cases of folks that have uh, children who are deaf, but parents or the siblings are not deaf themselves. So many parents, right, or siblings or other family members might choose to learn ASL in order to communicate with their children uh, or relatives in a way that is respectful and allows them to communicate and talk to each other. 
as an example of intercultural communication because even though the parent is not a member of the group, right, they're making efforts to accommodate and to understand that group's norms and beliefs, right? That culture is also a way that the thing, um, like normal, like English culture. Yeah. Deaf culture is a lot more like straightforward and to the point. Like if they're talking about someone, they'll say like that fat lady over there. Yeah. Where that would not be like acceptable in our culture. So it's a huge difference in culture. Yeah. And the to just the wording it and like not taking offense to it is something that like you have to like continuously work on. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing, Haley. That's a really good point, right? You're speaking to the way the context is different, right? Where you might consider deaf culture to be very low context and just very, very direct and clear, but that's also a barrier, right? As you were saying, somebody might be put off by ASL and just how direct that is compared to a lot of other languages. So I'm really glad uh, you were able to, to share bring that to the table too, right? Even within a lot of deaf communities, right? There's been a lot of debate and discussion, for instance, about cochlear implants that are designed to assist with hearing. There are many members of deaf communities who say, I don't like those, I don't want those, because those are uh, seen as uh, a risk of destroying uh, many of the deaf communities and cultures. Or there's challenges around whether or not deaf communities consider themselves to uh, identify more broadly with uh, disability communities, right? There's some folks or deaf that say, I'm not disabled, I don't identify as having a disability in some disease. So there's a lot of challenges, right, in how um, we think about culture and cultural membership along a lot of those lines. And, you know, really key goal uh, here, and again, something I think we were able to point to a bit, Haley, is the idea of ethnocentrism, right? Ethnocentrism is this belief uh, and challenge we have to deal with. Uh, that's a belief that somebody's own culture is better than somebody else's culture. And there's a lot of reasons that we might gravitate for that center of right? The biggest one would be familiarity, right? Or a fear of difference. Uh, we gravitate towards what we know, right? Um, so ethnocentrism can be a really big challenge when we're working in it with a group or with uh, various people from different backgrounds, because if we judge or we'll make fun of people uh, based on things such as you know, accent, tone of voice, and style of speaking. Oftentimes, culture plays a big role in some of those differences and can prevent us from fully accepting and considering, right, the needs of people from a lot of diverse backgrounds. So, I want to talk a little bit more about sort of what cultural studies is, right, and how we can think about cultural studies. How many folks have heard of or are familiar with Do Recall? Recall is uh, kind of considered one of the founders or pioneers of cultural studies, right? Cultural studies being the way that we can analyze and think about other cultures, the ways that they're developed, uh, created, and understood over time. Uh, Stuart Hall was really active in the 1970s and 80s, right? He was born in Jamaica and did a lot of work to study uh, the sort of ways that British culture interact and also was trying to understand specifically how to compare or think about differences between cultures and why some of those differences matter right so hall is really concerned with developing an understanding of the ways that members of different cultures communicate and engage with one another and i wanted to share a clip uh, that involves hall discussing uh, and situating some of the context of communication uh, well so let me go ahead that for you. The 70s and 80s witnessed brutal race riots, born of the political tensions of the times. And for one thinker, this was yet another symptom of a real struggle over culture. Stuart Hall was born in Jamaica, but after winning a scholarship to Oxford, went on to make his name as Britain's leading cultural theorist. In the 1980s, 
More and more schools will be taking in children from diverse family and cultural backgrounds. <laughs> In 1989, Paul saw hope for Britain's future in the acceptance and celebration of its multiculturalism, as he explained on The Late Show. As we slide out of the 1980s into a new decade, the key question is whether we're moving into new times. Who's going to define the cultural themes of the next 10 years? No one thinks harder about this question than Stuart Hall. To see the impulse of the British to close in on older images of myself in order to, you know, tight little island, join their suits around themselves, defend themselves with all this otherness that is pressing on them. And then I look at young black Asian kids in the third generation who've been born and brought up there, so they're not from anywhere else. And, you know, I just think creatively, culturally, they're just on top of the world. And they don't know where the next meal is going to come, but culturally, they just are enormous in a rich creative moment. When Stuart arrives in England, these questions of color and differentiation and difference that begin to obsess him, that begin to think, how do I describe myself? What sort of person am I? But of course, the idea of culture in Stuart Hall is very, very important because of what he wants to say about multiculturalism and immigrants to Britain. The Britishness that might be forced on them in many cases, as Hall points out, is really a very old fashioned Britishness. It's the Britishness of empire, it's the Britishness which has nothing to do with these people. At the start of the century, thinkers had fought for a single idea of culture. But by the end, it was as diverse as British society itself. And Stuart Hall made it clear that culture is a constantly changing force. We don't actually know what we value with culture anymore. Everything's interesting. High culture, low culture, from advertising to pop art to great art. It's all in a kind of mishmash now. So I think that there's a deeper question lying behind your question for me. I think you're asking me, how can people live without you know, some sense that there's an ultimate truth or ultimate scale of that. And I don't know, but I don't any longer think that this is just a transitional phase and that we're moving on to some other more settled period. I think, you know, we're in, culturally, we're in the kind of phase of permanent revolution. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, what I'm going to do is explore a little bit further. So, um, I think at the core of it, right, there's um, really some ideas that Hall brings in around the 1750s uh, that persist to this day, right? The discussion of uh, how, uh, for instance, folks that come from different backgrounds, including right, the roles of immigrants, migrants, impact, uh, how we understand culture. Uh, folks that come from a diverse range of cultural perspectives and backgrounds who born, right, in a country that they consider home. Uh, can can consider and relate to society. Uh, I like the idea that Paul brings in, right, that this very kind of old white um, understanding of like British culture or identity of tradition, right, is not something that's felt or experienced by many of the younger and more diverse perspectives. So there's a lot of discussion about the ways that culture is not just one thing that covers a single aspect like nationality, but the culture is felt richly across a variety of different forms of social difference. So I think what Hall is getting at, and again, that context of 1970s, 80s era Britain, where there was this focus on a younger generation that had more diverse backgrounds, is a way to get at some of these challenges and ways of thinking about culture uh, more broadly, and the way that they can impact groups, and how we understand and participate within groups. Also, pictured here, is Clifford Geertz, who uh, was an anthropologist and was really interested in studying sort of the rules and the ways that different group members participate with one another. Uh, for instance, Geertz is known for deep play, known from the Balinese talk fight, which is this sort of ethnographic and deep account of looking at in the country of Bali how uh, talk fighting is actually a really made cultural tradition and aspect of cultural life. With respect to Paul and Clifford Geertz, right? 
understanding and thinking about how we define and differentiate culture plays a really big role. Uh, what Hall suggests to bring to the table right, is the idea that cultures can be compared, not in a better or worse kind of way, but that there's different ways to measure or think about how cultures express and behave differently. For instance, we talked a little bit in this class already about the differences between high and low context cultures, right, where there's either a lot of subtlety or communication is very direct. Haley brought up, right, ASL might be an example of a lower context culture because it emphasizes really direct and straightforward communication. Another key idea here is that local perspectives help us understand culture better, right? A better way to understand and to make sense of culture by being involved in or participating within it, right? Uh, for instance, there's a lot of really great work. Um, for instance, uh, Dr. Jarofsky uh, in Anthosh is awesome. It does a lot of work related to indigenous culture, identity, in the surrounding area, right? A lot of her research is centered on uh, exploring and understanding indigenous cultures and the area. So the idea that by getting into and really engaging with members of a culture that we can understand them better is really important. Another key idea though is that you don't have to learn everything about a culture to be more sensitive and thoughtful to the needs of that culture, right? Uh, for instance, you might learn through customs or norms. For instance, maybe in another country it's not polite or accepted to kiss. Right? You don't have to learn and know absolutely everything to show openness to exploration. And this idea, right, that cultures have rules and norms that are learned. If you've ever been a new member of a group or a curricular, right, or athletic team, you oftentimes have to acclimate and adjust to the differences and uh, aspects of that group's identity. So you learn those rules and customs and behaviors, uh, what you do and don't do as a part of that. Experience matters, right? If you have personal experience, for instance, as a member of that culture, that's going to carry a unique type of weight, right? If you're a member, for instance, of a particular societal group, then that experience brings a lot to the table in the overall discussion. One example, right, of the importance of perspective and difference um, that I would point to, right, is in the context of neurodivergent communities, right? So folks that identify as neurodivergent, in a lot of different areas, including ADD, ADHD, autism, and so on, right? Identify a unique set of lived experiences that they might speak to. One challenge, right, is that in a lot of these kinds of communities, there are folks that might not be neurodivergent that are speaking for or advocating for uh, neurodivergent communities without being sensitive to or advocating really for those people, right? So if you're an ally or an advocate or a supporter of a social work to speak to, it's important that you're really representing and supporting the actual perspective um, you offer, right? Rather than uh, doing more damage to a community without actually uh, relating to them in an important way. So another idea, right, is international business and international relations that are also pretty profoundly affected by this process too. Uh, one idea that has been discussed a lot in recent years is the concept of neoliberalism, right? The idea that there's a combination of an open free market uh, with globalization and global connectedness. That in the current world that we live in, there's a lot of international trade of forming things like free trade agreements, right? Such as NAFTA. And that these types of relationships then impact cultures. That is, you're more connected to a lot of different companies and businesses from throughout the world, but that that also brings in challenges of a lot of smaller or local groups uh, that might feel a little bit crowded out in the global marketplace. So again, these are a lot of ideas, but we'll be discussing and breaking them, a lot of them more this week. And then uh, another key idea that Paul brings to the table is that culture is connected to so many different things. If you have taken a uh, course in humanities or maybe even business, right? There's a good chance that culture has come up at some point in the conversation. Uh, cultural studies is deeply connected, of course, to communication, to anthropology and sociology, to history, um, to music, to philosophy, to art, right? It connects to so many different areas because understanding and thinking about culture is a really major lens that shapes our understanding of the world more broadly. 
I think thinking about all cultural studies and the way that that's developed over time to sort of give a language to this process, I think is a way we can apply some of these issues to groups and how we engage within groups. Of course, right, in participating in a culture and thinking about culture and thinking across cultures, there's a lot of different challenges. One of those challenges being the issue of prejudice, right? So if you ever heard the term prejudice or you've heard somebody described as prejudice, right, it means making this type of negative judgment or opinion about somebody else. For instance, pictured here, right, you have um, images that represent gendered assumptions, right, that, for instance, um, things such as activities, uh, such as like video games, such as money, and so on, right, are gendered, um, and gender and expectations, right, lead us to believe or maybe reach certain conclusions about other people that aren't correct, right? Um, saying, oh, you don't want to play with a doll, you want to play with a fire truck, right? It's a gender assumption, potentially use of prejudice that we might give the children when we're thinking about the toys. So we have to avoid right, prejudice, prejudge, making an assessment, especially if we have members of a group that come from diverse and underrepresented perspectives, right? We're bringing in people that add to our discussion and add to the richness of our communication in the group. We have to think carefully about how prejudice impacts our judgment of others. Another idea that's important, right, is sometimes we over-focus on the culture and we ignore um, aspects of the individual and what makes that person you, right? Culture might be a huge part of who you are, but you're more than uh, that, right? You have a lot more things to bring to the table that aren't exclusively part of that. For instance, right, if somebody says, well, I'm an athlete, I'm a member of the volleyball team, right? That would be a big part of who that person is. But another idea is that that's not all that person is, right? They have activities, interests, things they like and dislike, and so on, that go beyond uh, simple membership. Stereotypes, right? Making, for instance, jokes or making judgments about other people, right? That are oftentimes prejudiced or biased. Oftentimes happens when we lack information, right? And we use stereotypes to fill in the gap. We can gender stereotypes that a uh, young boy would like playing with a fire truck or a young girl would like playing with uh, a doll, right? Or examples of how we invoke stereotypes with others. So it's true, right, that culture might not be the entirety of the person and just finding somebody on the basis of culture could be negative, but it can also be harmful to uh, assume that everyone is alike or homogenous, especially if people come from different cultural perspectives, right? For instance, maybe you're part of a small group and you're working together on uh, developing a new poster. And you say, part of the group, well, all of us can write cursive for this poster, right? And maybe there's a member of the group that comes from a cultural or educational background where they never learned cursive. That could be an example of assuming similarity or doing something like an inside joke, right? Or a movie or TV reference that not everybody gets uh, would be an example of some of the ways that we might not factor in uh, cultural difference, right? So small groups can be really relevant to the ways that we think about culture, right? Again, uh, here on the right are uh, the Paiute people. Again, one of the indigenous tribes in the area, along with Walla Walla and Umatilla. And small groups, right, including uh, maybe members of indigenous communities, can bring about shared goals and a sense of purpose. That is, if a culture is united by things such as goals and beliefs, so too are small groups. If you're a member of a culture and you really value, for instance, family, and you're a member of a team that itself considers itself kind of family, right? And see how those things can stack. In the same way, folks like Elena Gilaibada, small groups have history, they have context as a really thriving factor that impacts the way that they communicate. So that history really matters to understanding uh, how culture chooses to engage. Small groups, again, have norms, rules, customs, things that you do and don't do. Again, you're the MVP, maybe you go and get ice cream. 
Uh, those types of norms shape how smokers communicate. So, given these examples, right, small groups can be a culture, but a small group is also impacted by culture and how it's done. So, in the remaining four or five minutes, what I want you to do is to take some time on your own to think about the group that you've chosen for your reflection assignment and to think about what this group's culture is like. For instance, some of its unwritten rules, norms, values, and also be thinking about the way that this culture is communicated. Give you a little bit of time brainstorming to think about. Go ahead and finish the current sentence or thought that you're right. It's okay if it's not completely done. You can start to bring book. So, to wrap up for today and some of the things that we went over, uh, first of all, again, just working and thinking about the reflection essay uh, that will be due by the end of today on Wednesday. We started to talk about culture, including what culture is, how it relates to this idea of sheer beliefs and values among people that participate and work together in a group. And we also started to apply and connect it to how small groups behave and how that impacts things such as small group membership. So again, we post a lot of big ideas and a lot of concepts we're going to explore in more detail uh, later this week. For next thoughts. We'll talk about culture a bit more, including some of the ways that small groups manage issues, including uncertainty. Go we'll ahead and email or pass forward your attendance activity for today. Have a great rest of your Monday and look forward to seeing you again for Wednesday's talk.